hello, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, so welcome to our quarter two uh, market update. We did a client lunch about two weeks ago at Mayor Bulls in Brentwood, and we had a packed room and we had a long waiting list, actually. So I thought I would do a repeat. Um, there will be Q&A at the end. So at the bottom of your screen, you can go to the questions section and um, type in your questions. I've got Carson logged in as well. He will help me um, make sure we get to those. Um, so be sure to do that. And also we're gonna make a replay available if you wanna watch this at a later time or share it with your friends. So um, let's get going. Let me share my screen here. All right, well, there we go. So our team, we're just getting back. just wanted to show this slide. We were at the Raymond James National Conference last week at Gaylord um, with about three or 4,000 people. And so that was a great time for us to network with our peers. I really missed that over the last couple of years. We haven't had a conference since 2019. So the whole team got to go. I had a chance to speak in front of 3,000 people, which was, um, I haven't done that in a long time. I don't know if I've spoken to that many people. Um, ever. Um, but it was just great, great networking. We learned a lot. Part of that was we got to learn about the market and the economy with um, top industry economists and experts and Larry Adam, who's the Raymond James CIO, Chief Information Officer. And he's actually the one who presented at our lunch a couple weeks ago. But today you have me. So, all right. Well, a little light humor to um, break the ice. Um, is inflation affecting your family? 195% said yes, 124% said no. The joke is that adds up to a lot more than 100%. It's always great making jokes when you can't tell if anyone is laughing or see faces. So I'm just, I just picture a huge audience. Everybody's laughing. David, you're so funny. Okay. Um, now, Larry had a, this whole presentation and I took out the, um, the music for this, but it was a Beatles theme. And so there's a Beatles theme around it. You may notice it. I'll reference it a little bit. Um, I thought it was kind of cute. This one was uh, about starting with Russia and Ukraine. Um, he played the song Come Together by the Beatles. So obviously the war has been a, um, it's been a huge part of the market volatility this year. That's no surprise. We've seen countries coming together to punish Putin. Um, next slide here. Russia economy. This is all really just showing that the Russia economy has absolutely, absolutely been getting hammered, you know. But the big question is, what will Putin do? And that's the risk. I certainly don't know. None of the economists, we, the smartest people in the room last week at the conference, they didn't know, of course. But that's the thing that we're all watching. But there's no doubt that um, their economy is getting beat up pretty bad. And a question I get all the time is, you know, David, is globalization dead? You know. Um, and the answer is no. I mean, the West, the reality here, if you see, look at this slide, um, the West needs the East and vice versa. It's, it's nothing short of a global economy. We've seen that with the supply chain issues through COVID, uh, chips and processors and things like that. Um, and also how NATO has really come together to pressure Russia and basically to go out and squeeze another country who's not playing nice. So it's times like this and crises COVID, the Russia-Ukraine war, that we do see that globalization is not only dead, but it's it's vital to the world economy. Um, another Beatles reference, uh, the song Yesterday. Uh, the biggest question I get about the economy right now in my individual client meetings at our lunch in a couple of weeks ago and on the phone every day is, is this a recession that we're in now? Now, I'll say there's still some good things going on. Um, Things like consumer balance sheets are um, solid and companies have a lot of cash, uh, really, really good shape there. And that's a very positive thing. But and it's very different than 2008. But I do feel that things aren't going to be easy ahead. Um, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic, definitely cautious for sure. And I think now I know now that planning is more important than ever. Going back to my three buckets and the retire while you work philosophy that we talk about during times of volatility when the markets you know, not having a, a great year like it's been so far. We have to go back to planning and rely on the plan. How much cash do we have? How much do we have in retirement? How much do we have saved up to pay off the house and kids college? 
that will take away a lot of the anxiety around what's going on day to day in the market. Um, so there's lots of uh, headline recession talk. It's all over the media now, okay? And so let's look at this. A lot going on in this slide, but you know, you're seeing Goldman Sachs coming out and saying they see there's a 35% chance of a recession in the next two years. What does that even mean? I'll tell you, there's an in a normal year, there's a 20% chance. So about one out of five years, one out of four years, the market is down anyway. So there's always about a 20, 25% chance. So 35%, you could argue it's not, it's elevated, but it's not that high of a chance. Um, and, and why? Why is this? Well, a lot of the key indicators are still not flashing recession. Remember 2020, was technically a recession. It happened so fast. Most people don't realize that. A recession is two consecutive quarters of negative growth. We had that first quarter, and then it barely was negative the second quarter. And by the time they called it a recession, the market had already almost recovered totally from the 34% drop it had. So I try not to get caught up on the word recession. Um, usually by the time we know a recession is here, the market is already uh, again bottomed and it's back on the its road to recovery. And that's why, again, um, the, the, the headlines calling something a recession is very backward looking and we try to focus on what's, what's ahead. Um, here are some of the metrics we track. You don't have to go, I'm not going to go through every one of them. I just wanted to show you when I said that most of the indicators aren't um, showing signs of recession. This is what I mean. Um, you can see these indicators that um, a lot of economists track. Um, I'm hearing more about 2024 being a recession year, but again, who knows? I could almost argue and say, who cares? That sounds kind of flippant, but in, in a lot of ways, it doesn't matter to our long-term plans. And if you miss the returns, this is the thing. If you miss the returns that happen before you expect a, a recession. So let's say when COVID started and people started saying, oh my gosh, we're about to go into a recession. And again, we did, but it was quick. If you had a missed 2020 and 21, the returns in the market the last two years, because you were nervous about a recession, even if we're in a recession right now, the market falls 20%, but you missed 30% return in the last couple of years, you're better off staying through the full course and cycle of the market. Um, I've been doing this for 20 years. There's no secret sauce. Timing does not work. Um, it just doesn't. But we are rebalancing accounts. We just did that. Actually, if you're a client, you got an email this morning. Um, we're adding value um, around our growth stocks. We're adding some more of those value stocks that we feel do good in recessionary periods, just kind of gearing up for that and adding some things like alternatives to help with yields around bonds and different things. So we don't have to time the market. There are things that we can do strategically that are small tweaks that over time add up and can really help get you through a recession and be more opportunistic, even when things are a little yucky. Um, just some more metrics here. Um, basically showing a strong labor market, meaning that the amount of taxes being withheld are up 20% year over year. That's the fastest ever. Capital expenditures, that's you know what companies are spending on um, new equipment, et cetera, highest since World War II. And then the lending standards, they're also easy. Even though rates are going up, which I'll talk about in a, in a little bit, uh, the lending standards are still um, fairly lax. All those things are, are typically not recessionary. Um, People are out moving again. No surprise. There's so much pent-up demand for at least, I'd say for at least two more years. Even if we're going through inflation and times are tough and the markets and the economy is getting beat up a little bit, people are traveling, they're spending money, they have cash in their accounts from whether it's from the stimulus money or just saving and not traveling the last couple of years. I think that that's what can neutralize all the negative things going on in the economy. The fact that there's so much pent up demand and people wanting to get out and about and spend money, those two could balance each other out. Meaning that maybe the stock market doesn't tank this year. Maybe it's not way up, but maybe it ends up, ends up a little bit or down five or 10%, but we don't see a 2008 type of scenario, if that makes sense. Just my opinion. Um, so I wanna talk about inflation for a second. It's, it's no surprise that costs are going up, even if income is going up some. So, you know, people, you know minimum wage has go, gone up. The average wages have gone up a little bit. But the challenge is, this is just a quick example, some quick math showing the average family, if their, you know, income went up 400 bucks and then gas, by the time you factor in the additional prices with gasoline and groceries and rent, they're still coming out to the negative. So this, that stimulus money that went out to help families was really almost totally wiped out by the higher cost of goods. Um, 
yeah, just just some more stats showing that none of this is a surprise. It's all over the news right now, and all of us are feeling it. Whether you're lower, middle, upper class, it doesn't matter. Everybody's feeling it right now. But to different effects, for sure, the lower and the middle class are are really feeling it because they're after tax discretionary income is a lot lower as a percentage of their overall income and they're spending more of their overall income. So they're getting hit with this, um, this inflation quite a bit more. Um, this is the biggest pro I see positive. I see for the market. There's a ton of cash and savings. You can see, look at, look at that since 1951 to 2021 and look at that chart two and a half trillion dollars in excess savings. That's always a good thing, you know, when it comes to an economy having cash on the sidelines. So remember that. All right, let's talk about monetary policy and the Fed. Beatles reference here, if you can guess, the Fed will need to speak more words of wisdom. Let it be, right? All right, so interest rates are gonna rise over the next year, they already have been, that's no surprise. So that's the bottom line here is that we see that continuing to happen. Um, 40 years, we've had, I mean, look at this chart. We've had 40 years since of the um, rates going, Fed funds rates were higher, going down to almost zero. We knew this was coming. We just weren't sure when. I've had economists talking with us for the last 10 years saying rates have got to have got to start going back up. They're almost zero. They can't stay this low. And they did, and they did for a long time, and money was cheap. So the spending and the getting was good. And now things are going to have to balance out and it's going to probably be a little bit painful. Um, rates are still so historically low, but it feels really yucky, especially for first time home buyers out there. When just six, three months ago, gosh, three, four months ago, you could get a 30 year mortgage for 3%. Some of you had a client in yesterday that had a 2.7% locked in rate. They got a year or two ago. And now that rate's like five and a quarter, five and a half percent. That's a big jump. That's changing the affordability. So a house that was 400,000 is now 600,000 because it's gone up in value and the rate's gone from three to five and a half percent. That's that's a tough, tough scenario. Um, same thing with gas, food and industrials. This is a big problem for the current administration. Um, again, nothing I say is meant to be political. I talk both ways about, about both sides. I'm just looking at the economics of everything. The administration said it was transitory, inflation that is. Um, that was kind of the, the line they were using. Then they blamed it on Russia and COVID. Um, all are affecting inflation, but the biggest hit was probably the $6 trillion of spending on the stimulus. Um, prices won't come down until demand decreases. And like I just said, there's still a lot of demand. So time is likely going to be the only saving factor. I don't think this is going to be, we're just going to jump out of inflation in three to six months. I, I, I just don't see how that's possible. But there are some positives. Look, look at the, these charts, basically showing that um, we're slowly getting there. This is good, but again, it's slow. You can't fix it overnight, but like some of the backlogs, the delivery times are down, inventory levels are starting to increase. Places like Target have higher inventories, a lot higher than they had during COVID. Um, same thing here, international freight costs and trucking freight. Um, the rates are starting to come down. So there's shipping costs. These are all positive things, but you can see how fast it went up and you can see how slow it's starting to come down. But again, we have to start somewhere and that's at least in the right direction. Now, um, this is uh, lowest, Biden has the lowest uh, approval rating of his presidency so far right now. He is taking uh, most of the blame for inflation. So you can see um, uh, people are um, blaming Biden at 38%. They're also blaming COVID at 28%, corporate price increases, and then Russia at only 6%. So all those things are factoring in, but it certainly is a problem for the current administration, which likely means there'll be a Republican sweep. That's already uh, this fall. That's normal. It happened with Trump. It happened with um, Obama. Um, usually the House and Congress, the House and the Senate flip kind of at midterms, um, the market's expecting that to happen again. That's what this third chart over here is showing that the likelihood um, of that happening, no surprise there, I wouldn't think. Uh, let's talk about fixed income some. Um, oh, Beatles reference. Yields won't get back, get back to where they once belonged. I wish, I'm not gonna sing a webinar and I definitely wouldn't know y'all's reaction to that, but part of me wants to sing the Beatles right now. Um, Anyway, I digress. So 20 years, I've never seen anything like this. This is um, 
look at the bond market. When I told you bonds were down, you know, have been down over 10%. It's been since like 1980 when that happened. They were down about that a little bit more in, in the 80s. So 40 years, um, we'll say 20 years. In 20 years, I've never seen it. It hasn't happened since the late 70s. And I was, oops, I was born in the 70s. So I certainly, uh, I, was, I was a baby when this happened the last time. But bonds are supposed to be safe. Um, this will correct back to a norm. It, it Typically, the market has a way of doing that. And we just haven't, again, we haven't seen this in fixed income, but we've had 40 years of declining rates and now interest rates are rising. And so bonds are adjusting to that. But we expect that to, to kind of come back. We have been monitoring fixed income a lot. You've seen a lot of our emails about changes and shifts we're making in that space. Um, bonds aren't exciting, but again, they're supposed to be um, the place to put your money so that you don't have stock market like volatility. So this isn't the norm. Um, and we're aware of that. Um, so we've been adding alternatives and changing up the types of bonds that we own repositioning. We actually sold a lot of our bonds and then bought other bonds so that we could take a tax loss for clients. It's the first time in 20 years I've ever tax loss harvested bonds. Um, that sounded really nerdy. For those of you who know what that meant, that's a CPA term. Um, again, I've sent out emails to you if you're a client, so you probably know what that means and you'll appreciate it come tax time. It'll save you some money on taxes. All things that we're trying to do, make lemonade out of lemons when um, the market's getting beat up a little bit. Um, but we're on top of it. Right now, there's just no safe space. Cash isn't paying anything. Banks aren't paying anything. Bonds are getting beat up a little bit, although we expect that to, to change. And stocks are your only place to really, in theory, keep up with and beat inflation along with real estate. But nobody wants to own 100% stock, right? All right, the housing market. This is going to really impact things. Um, I mentioned this before. You can see on this first chart that um, mortgage rates up over 5%. Again, that's historically low. You can see just back in 2002, they were 7%. But most of us, and especially the first time home buyers, all they've ever known and heard about is you know these 3% mortgages. And now they're getting their first taste of 5%. Um, so that's gonna change, maybe slow down the housing market a little bit. Um, it's gonna become more expensive, not only for individuals, but also for companies to borrow. You can see the corporate interest rates are higher too. So that typically slows down an economy, right? Because companies aren't going to have access to free money or cheap money, two and 3% capital to go buy a million dollars worth of new machines. They're gonna think twice about paying 6% interest. Um, so some of that should slow down. That's very typical. Um, now let's talk about stocks for a minute. Uh, US equities still have the ticket to ride higher. Got a ticket to ride. All right, I'll stop. Carson's way back there shaking his head. I definitely hear that song playing in my head. Um, many economists, uh, I'm having such a good time by myself over here. Jolene's down here at my feet. She's not amused. Um, many economists still have the base case um, being that we're not going to have a recession. That's kind of their base case. That's the over 50%. Um, and they still see some potential slight upside for the S&P. I hope they're right. It's hard to see right now for me too. I get it. I don't personally... I'd be happy if the market just kind of stayed down where it is now, maybe came up a little bit. Um, of course, nobody knows, but that's what um, the majority of economists are predict predicting right now. Let's talk about that a little bit. Um, so we just came off of a hot, two really hot years, really three, because 2019 was a good year um if you were in a diversified portfolio as well so we expect a slowdown for sure the chart on the right shows that typically during as a bull market matures you know the first you can see year one two and three usually you have a big year and then you have a mediocre year and then by the third year you're just barely positive you know you could argue that we're kind of in that later stage of this cycle um, but again the market makes fools of the smartest people every day so trying to predict the the market is is really a, is really a fool's game, but we have to look at history and things to have some sort of point of reference. So I wanted to show you that. Um, I won't go through all this. This is this is more of the bull market checklist. This is just more metrics that a lot of the economists we speak to look at. Things about the economy, the earnings of company, valuations of companies, corporate activity, seasonality. All of these things are still pointing slightly in the direction of a bull market, and none are really bearish yet. So it means they're not a strong bull like they were two or three years ago, but a lot of things are still, and you, and, you know, you could sit there and read through each of these. I won't, I won't go through all that, but, but basically, you know, as an example saying, um, you know, like if you look at 
um, the economy. Growth is probably going to be less um, of a tailwind as originally estimated as rising commodity prices so energy and things like that and the uncertainty in Russia, Ukraine. They, you know, a lot of economists have downgraded their forecast, but they're still slightly to the right towards a bull market, indicating they think there may be, you know, a year or two left in this bull market. So take that for what it's worth. All right, we're going to get to quite a few more slides here. Um, I wanted to show, let me click through some of these things. This is interesting. The S&P, you know, historically, has, has used to be mostly all energy, and now it's really dominated by tech. So if you look on the right where it says today, Apple and Google and Amazon and Tesla, they dominate um, the, you know, the, the S&P. And tech has been absolutely hammered this year. Had a great couple of years. Uh, we had clients up you know, 30, 40, 50% in technology. And then this year, technology has just been, I mean, I think half of the stocks in the NASDAQ are down over 50%. So terrible year for technology, kind of resetting. But we do feel that um, we believe in it. We think over the next five to 10 years, innovation and technology is where so much of the growth is going to come from. So it's a great time, you know, stay the course if you're in it, you know, certainly don't sell low, but also if you have new cash and dry powder, we have clients that are feeling a little more risk, you know, pro risk and, and willing to jump into that in, in that space and add new dry powder and double down on their tech position. I'm not suggesting that to everybody, obviously, but it's something to consider. Um, but just interesting um, that, the majority of the S&P is dominated by technology now. Um, seven out of the 10 companies are now tech related. They used to be energy, that's that's crazy. This actually, I want, I, I'd ask Larry this question one time, well, what about inflation adjusted? Because of course the companies were a lot smaller 40 years ago. This is actually inflation adjusted here. And you can still see the size on the chart, the magnitude, the difference of the size of the market cap of those top 10 companies or so. Um, compared to all the companies before. So those 10 companies dominate so much of the S&P 500. Um, so you think about like Apple, totally, totally different like that. Apple is no longer an apples to apples comparison. But in 2001, look at those devices. Remember the, the Macintosh, the, the, the computers that look like that? And then Apple in 2021, I mean, my goodness, right? Look at all of the things, how many things these tech companies are involved in. Everything from um, Apple TV, Ted Lasso, great show, by the way, um, the Apple Watch and, you know, just all the different apps and um, the phones, the laptops, the headphones, the wireless, you know, earbuds, all those things. Um, same thing with Amazon. Remember when Amazon used to just be online books? Literally, that was just 20 years ago. That's all Amazon was. And now look at it. You get the point, right? My goodness, um, Amazon on Whole Food, Zappos, Audible, Amazon Prime, and on and on and on. These these tech companies are mammoth companies. MGM. I mean, um, all right. So shift a little bit. Let's talk about international for a minute. I get that question a lot. The Beatles references help. International equities need some help. And we've been way overweight U.S. stocks in our portfolios here for, gosh, about eight years now. Uh, and we're still doing that. Eventually, that should turn. I've had economists saying, gosh, international has been underperforming the U.S. for 10 years now. They, they've got to have their heyday at some point. But we still don't think, and I'm still not hearing that now is the time to go heavier, especially with everything going on internationally. And specifically, let me, let me tell you what I mean by that. There's still so many reasons to own U.S. Um, <clears throat> just look at like everything from the return on assets, the return on equity, uh, margins of companies. All these things are heavily in favor of the U.S. over Europe, Japan, and the emerging markets. And some of the most trusted brands globally, like Google and PayPal and Amazon, they're all U.S. companies. So that hasn't shifted. I mean, you can see the, those top 15 companies the majority are U.S. Um, your, the Europe economy also got uh, hit a lot harder than, oh, let me go back, got hit a lot harder than the U.S. Um, during COVID and everything, much harder. 
in Europe, you look over at European wages, they aren't going up near as fast as ours. And then also look at the price of gas. So their wages aren't going up as fast as ours. And the average price of gas for a gallon is $7.55 in drug. Yikes, compared to $4.32% or $4.32, also yikes here in the US. But what a difference, especially if your income is not going up as much. So that's what I mean, the European economy, it's just been, um, the, the growth has been more muted. The average consumer is, is feeling it a lot harder than we are. So we just don't see a lot of opportunity there. Now, diversification, you always want to own some US, some international, some bonds, some cash. And we do, we've just been quite a bit more overweighted to US and international. And we continue that theme. Hopefully that makes sense. Starting to wrap up. All right, let's wrap, um, we'll wrap up the Beatles theme a little bit. I like this kind of chart. Uh, again, wrapping up the Beatles team, and also we work with a lot of musicians uh, being here in Nashville. I thought this was interesting. Um, so this applies, so this basically says like 90 there's millions of musicians. Um, obviously, we all know only a few actually make it, and we've seen it here in Nashville, and I've heard all the stats, but let's say 90% go undiscovered. Um, they never, nobody knows who they are. Less than 2% even are lucky enough to get a one number one, not even a number one, like a, just a one hit. They become the one hit wonders and only 0.2% of them ever become household names like the Beatles and have songs like Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, Yellow Submarine, all these amazing songs we know and love about the Beatles. Um, my point, this applies to finding the next, this is why we need to be diversified. This applies to finding the next best tech company or cryptocurrency. There's so many different, you know, tech companies and cryptos and yada, yada, yada which we can't give advice on crypto, but I'm just speaking generically, that the likelihood of you going and just finding that one and hitting a home run is very, very, very low. So you'd have to own a basket of all these different investments. And that's what we do is we bring in, and it seems boring sometimes because everybody wants to get the Apple back in the 1980s or 90s at $10 a share, of course, but nobody wants to lose 100% of their portfolio if they're wrong. So that's why we diversify. Isn't this cute? All you need is love. Long-term approach to investing, objectives to set your optimal allocation. That's what we do in our meetings. We go through your objectives. What is the money for? When are you going to use your kid's college? Our three-year-old doesn't need it for 15 years. We can be more uh, aggressive going through the optimal allocation. Vision not being clouded by volatility. Very true right now. A lot of volatility out there. It's easy to lose sight of long-term vision of your plan and say, I just want to pull the plug. I hate the stock market. I hate investing. I'm scared. I want to go to cash. Don't let that happen. And then E, evaluate your risk tolerance. We do that in every meeting. Every client that comes in here, we ask, we tell them the first thing in the meeting, okay, you are 80% stock, 20% bonds. This is what we think from a textbook perspective and based on your time horizon and your goals. How do you feel about it? And we have that conversation, that heart to heart, and we go through that. All we need is love. And we get by, gosh, he, this presentation has so many good Beatles references. Getting by with a little help from my friends. Um, last slide before I do questions. Just a reminder, you've seen this, if you're a client of mine, you've seen this for me many, many times. Timing the market, if you were to, the S&P over the last 20 years has averaged about 14%. Um, if you missed just the 20 best days out of 20 years, 20 days, those best days, and those best days usually come right after the Dow's down a thousand points and the next day is one of the best days. Your average return is zero. You made zero dollars if you missed 20 days. If you just missed 10 days, your return goes from 14 down to only 2%. Um, and that's because on the next chart, the best and the worst days are typically grouped together. The market doesn't just free fall and then have a bunch of great days. It's down 800, up 600, down 400, up 700, down, you know, you get the point. So stay the course. That's just a friendly reminder from your friendly wealth manager. And with that, questions. Let me stop my screen share. I don't know if we have any questions. Oh. Okay, so if you want to ask a question, feel free to type it in. I only had one that asked about the bull market checklist as of today or April, and I, then that question is checked off as answered because I went through that in one of my slides. So thanks for that question. Um, hopefully I answered that question. 
Um, I don't see any other questions typed in. That either means that I did a fantastic job and answered all your questions, or I lost everybody to a good nap. You have your headphones on and you're listening to the Beatles, something like that. Maybe I inspired you to do that, which is also great. Um, that being said, I'm gonna give it another second here. See if my types of question in, doesn't look like they are. Thank you. Um, I will, um, the team in the next week or two, will send out a replay of this. We'll put it on YouTube and social and send it out to our clients by email. Um, biggest takeaway for you is if you have a question about your specific situation that I did not address, please call or email me, email the team. Let's set up a meeting. Let's get on the phone. Let's get on Zoom. Come see us. We're here to help. Thank you so much. And you'll be hearing from us soon. Thanks.